And now we're going to step into 1110. Now, I have to admit, in 1110, there's a lot of um, online content for several reasons. Um, so let me give you those reasons really quickly. 1110 is, in my opinion, I glued together 1110 and 1111 because they're the same section, really. So this is technically the last section in chapter 11. At which everybody's probably like, finally. Um, chapter 11 is generally a, the longest chapter in all of calculus. So it's 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 up there as being the hardest too. But uh, So anyway, uh, there's quite a bit that's online for uh, mainly two reasons. One, time constraints. Um, it's just impossible to go through everything in class. And two, and this is kind of a bigger reason, is that there's some concepts here that I never, that most uh, instructors never test on. However, it's good to know some things in the background. So those, that material I shuttle to online lecture. And uh, I'll tell you about those as we get there. And then um, there's some prerequisite topics. Uh, like if you don't remember um, what binomial series are, there's a prerequisite video on that. So there are little things like that. Um, that would be nice to uh, watch if you um, if you have the time, if you can do it. I'm going to take a drink. Hold on a second. All right. So now we are at the um, most, I think, the most important part. Uh, and it's just because it's near and dear to my heart. This, this uh, material we're about to go into right here is basically how the world works when it comes to modeling functions and then um, using those models to do some very creative stuff. So we have had so far power series uh, based on two forms, the geometric power series, actually really based on just one form, the geometric power series, right? So we know the summation n equals zero to infinity of x to the nth power. If it converges, it will conver converge to one over one minus x. And it will converge as long as the absolute value of x is less than one. Yay. But what power series that just is not um, a geometric series? What if it's something completely different? And so... We are going to start that conversation now. How would you build the power series, basically, is, is the question. So let's assume two things. One, we're given a function f, and that function has a power series expansion about a center we're going to call a. You might want to center it at 15. You might want to center it at negative 2. There are reasons to center a power series around different values. Uh, but for right now, most of our work will center around 0, but there are very special reasons why you do need to know how to center it elsewhere. All right, so suppose I hand you a function and suppose that you can find a power series expansion for that function. And that is actually uh, not always true. There are some functions that just don't have power series representations, period. Okay, so that's a heads up right now. Not all functions have power series representations. All right, so that is, we're gonna assume technically it shouldn't say f of x equals there. It should say that f of the power series for f of x is equal to uh, the summation from zero to infinity of c sub n x minus a to the n. Remember, this is the general power series right here. And we're saying f has a power series expansion. So I'm going to actually just do this because <laughs> that's bothering me. I don't want to say that f is equal to that yet. So we're just going to say that uh, f has the, the power series summation n equals 0 to infinity of c sub n times x minus the center to the nth power. Okay. That's our first assumption. Our second assumption is that f is infinitely differentiable. And that's why not all functions have power series because not all functions have an infinite number of derivatives, okay? But 
we're going to assume that f is infinitely differentiable. Think about functions right now that have an infinite number of derivatives. Polynomials, sine, cosine, tangent, you can take its derivative an infinite number of times. Um, cotangent, secant, cosecant, uh, natural log if it's not natural log of x, but instead natural log. Well, yeah, natural log of x is fine, actually. So a lot of functions are infinitely differentiable, but not every function is. So that's just a heads up. And and I should mention maybe natural log is a bad one to talk about. Let's not talk about the natural log or the tangent. They have problems with asymptotes. Okay. So what can we do with these assumptions? All right. So for now, uh, it should say, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it should say F has a power series expansion. And now I see why I wrote that. F is equal to this expansion. It's not always true. So this is a big, big assumption. So if that is the case, actually, I am going to erase this. So that is F has a power series expansion and F is equal to that expansion. That's why I wrote that. <laughs> there we go. All right. So what can we do with that piece of information? Well, let's see. If F of X is equal to the summation n equals zero to infinity of c sub n times x minus a to the nth power, then f is equal to, I'm going to expand this out a little bit. I hope you don't mind. f is equal to c naught times x minus a to the zeroth, which is just one, plus c1 times x minus a to the first, plus c2 times x minus a squared plus dot, dot, dot. The problem here is we don't know what those values of the coefficients of the power series, we don't know what those values are. This, 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 and so on and so forth, all those values right there, we don't know these. These are unknown to us. But right now, and right here, we're going to find them out. One easy thing we can do is ask ourselves, what is F of A? If you take a look at that power series expansion, which we're saying right now, F has a power series and it's equal to its power series expansion. What is F at A? Well, if you plug a into F, you get C naught plus C one A minus A plus C two A minus A squared plus dot, dot, dot. I hope you realize that all terms in that power series expansion, except for the zero term disappear. So this will imply that f of a is equal to c naught. That is, we have successfully, successfully found the zeroth coefficient. Now, you look at that and you say, well, good for us. But honestly, that's just one coefficient out of an infinite number of coefficients. What else do you have for me? What else can I do? Well, again, if F is equal to that power series expansion, F prime, sorry, pen is deciding to be a bugger. F prime of X, well, here's the power series expansion right here. And in fact, let me write it out a few more terms because I, I definitely want to really drive the point home. All right. The derivative, well, the constant disappears and we get C1 
times the derivative of x minus a, which is just one, plus the derivative of, wait for my screen, the derivative of this guy, which is going to be 2c2 times x minus a. So let's write that down. Now we go to the next term in line. This one, when you take its derivative, will be 3c3 x minus a squared. The next one will be 4c4 x minus a cubed and so on and so forth down the line. Let me do a little bit of highlighting here because I need to keep that in sight. And I'm going to evaluate this derivative at A as well. Notice when you plug A into the derivative for X, all the terms turn off except for the first term. So not only have we found C naught, it's just F evaluated at the center, but we've set, found C1, it's F prime evaluated at the center. Now, if you were to stop here, you might think, hey, all those coefficients, they're just the derivative or F evaluated at the center. It's either F evaluated center the, of the first derivative of f evaluated the center, maybe the second derivative of f evaluated the center, and so on and so forth. But that is actually not true. If we go one more derivative, f double prime, we get, looking up here, the derivative of the constant is a zero. Derivative of the next term in line is two C2. The derivative of the next term in line is three times two C3, X minus A. The next one in line is four times three C4, X minus A squared plus dot, dot, dot. And again, I'm going to evaluate that second derivative at the center. Because when you evaluate the center, it turns all the other terms off except for the first term, which is 2C2. We'll do one more derivative. This is a lesson in connectors. I'm using connector words also additionally. So now I'm going to do more over. The third derivative will set the pattern. Derivative of a constant, that's zero. The derivative of the next one in line is three times two times, I'm going to put a one there, c sub three plus the derivative of the next one in line is four times three times two. It's supposed to be a two times C sub four X minus a to the first plus the next one in line will be five times four times three C sub five X minus a squared plus dot, dot, dot. And if you evaluate the second derivative at, again, the center, I'm sorry, the third derivative at the center, all the other terms turn off except for the first one. And the first one, the way I've written it, three times two times one, is three factorial C sub three. 
because I've written it as three factorial. I just want to draw your attention back to this guy right here. That two is the same thing as two factorial. And that one C one is the same thing as one factorial C one. And that one C naught at the top, why not six? Because you'll never see the pattern if you just write six. You need to see the pattern. And that C naught all the way at the top there, the highlighted F of A is equal to one C naught. One C naught is the same thing as zero factorial C naught because zero factorial is defined to be one. Now I hope you do see the pattern, right? The pattern is the following. If C naught, let me write it this way, this implies C sub zero is equal to F of A over zero factorial. C1 is equal to F prime at A over one factorial. C2 is F double prime at A over two factorial. C sub three is F triple prime at a over three factorial. You see right here shows it. There are threes everywhere in this. C sub three is the third uh, Taylor, I'm sorry, the third, third power series coefficient. Uh, its value is the third derivative at the center divided by three factorial. And the fourth coefficient is gonna be the fourth derivative uh, evaluate the center all over four factorial and so on and so forth. It is a pretty amazing process. And so remember what this is all predicated on. The assumption is F has a power series and F is equal to that power series. That's how we were able to say, oh, look, what's F of A? And what's F prime at A? And what's F double prime? Because we knew F was equal to its power series. That was the assumption. Also, very important, F has all derivatives. You could see why that's a requirement. Because if F doesn't have all derivatives, this process will break down because you'll reach a point where one of our coefficients doesn't have a representation because we don't have a derivative for that. So you have to make sure that F has all of its derivatives. Lucky us, almost every function in the world does have an infinite number of derivatives. So we're okay. But the punchline is this, that power series right there, if F is equal to its power series, then we've just proven at least for N equals zero through three, you do a process of induction to showcase it for all, that F will equal to the summation N equals zero to infinity. The nth coefficient is the nth derivative of F evaluated at the center divided by N factorial. And then we still have x minus a to the nth. And that's how you can build a power series for any function I hand you. That's called the Taylor series expansion, named after a mathematician with the last name of Taylor, who I don't know his first name for, so that's okay. And there's a dude named McLaurin that came along a little bit later and said, um, if you center this at zero, that's me. I'm going to name that one. So if you hear the word McLaurin or the phrase McLaurin series, it means the center's at zero. However, I will rarely say that. I'll write that, but I'll rarely say that. I will say the Taylor series centered at zero. It's just, I like to attribute the guy who did all the work rather than the guy who jumped on the back of the guy who did all the work. All right. So really very cool. And to kind of codify it all into one big statement, there it is right there. The Taylor power series expansion about a center A, also known as the Taylor series of our function, is the following, what we just wrote down. The summation zero to infinity of the nth derivative of our function evaluated at the center divided by n factorial 
times x minus a to the n. Now remember, f has to have an infinite number of derivatives, and we're assuming f is actually equal to its power series when we do this. And that is a no-no in general, but there is a way around it. So we'll talk, we don't have to actually talk about it, but I will briefly. If the center is zero, some people, not me, but some people call it the Maclaurin series. So you will, if somebody says, hey, find the Maclaurin series for this function, they're telling you, by the way, it's just a Taylor series centered at zero. So A will be zero. A little bit of a warning. It is common to think that f of x is always equal to its Taylor series. However, this is only true if a very, very specific condition is met. And uh, I mentioned that actually in a video I did yesterday and I already posted on our website. Um, and I'd state right here, hence many functions do not equal their Taylor series expansions. There's actually an infinite number of functions that do not equal their Taylor series expansions. However, you are not going to deal with any of those. So the punchline here is you have a safety net. All the functions we're going to deal with have Taylor series expansions and they're equal to them. That's the blessings of Calc 2. That now from this point forward, if I hand you a function, I say, I need the um, power series for it. You can use this and derive the power series. We'll see it in a moment, but I just want to drive that point home because I think I would be somewhat worried myself. So let's go ahead and start with this statement. Find the McLaurin series expansion. That basically means find the Taylor series expansion about zero for e to the x and find its radius of convergence. Now, we already know the power series for e to the x, but we never actually proved it. I just told you, oh, by the way, this is the power series for e to the x. But now we're going to prove it. And it's not much of a proof. Okay. So let f of x equal e to the x. Now, if we can assume that f has a power series expansion about zero, I'm actually going to write that down. One, if we assume F has a power series about, zoom out a little bit, X equals zero, and that F is equal to this, And two, if we assume F has all derivatives, which it does, it's not much of an assumption there, then, so first thing we have to assume is that F has a power series expansion about zero and two, uh, and, and that it's equal to that power series expansion. And two, F has derivatives of all orders. It's e to the X. So yes, it has derivatives of all orders. So if those two conditions are met, then e to the X, which is F, is going to equal the summation N equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative of F evaluated at zero over N factorial times x minus zero to the nth. Notice I replaced a's with zeros. And Avi's asking, good question, will we, will we always assume this for all Taylor series? Yep, you better believe it. You can always assume that f is equal to its power series expansion and that um, f has the power series expansion and f is infinitely differentiable. For our purposes, these two, check, check, are always checked. Okay, so don't even bother. You don't have to write that down even. I don't care. That's not what, so if I said find the power series expansion for e to the x, you could just start here <laughs> and just say, okay, I know e to the x is equal to this. Let's go ahead and find out what all those derivatives are. 
This one's going to be super easy because it's e to the x, but I want to showcase how you're going to do this. I'm going to write down a, I'm going to build a table, basically. Let me keep it clean here. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll even do this. I just want to showcase this so that uh, we don't have to, you don't only see an easy example and then have to get into some terrible example on your own and not know how to do it. There's no such thing as terrible examples with Taylor series. They're all beautiful. That should be enough lines. And I'm going to just make some columns here. I don't know how many I have to actually remind myself. So the first column is going to be whatever n we're at. So for example, n equals zero, one, two, three, four, and five, let's just say. And the second column, so I'll make it a little bit wider, is going to be for uh, the, what is the nth derivative at x, not at zero, but just at x. For example, the zeroth derivative of our function is actually the original function. That's what a zeroth derivative is. So it's just e to the x. Then the first derivative, well, that's e to the x. <laughs> then the second derivative, well, that's e to the x, e to the x, e to the x. So you can see why this is kind of a very famous and easy example is because the derivatives are all very easy. Then I gave myself way too much room on this. The third column is going to be that nth derivative evaluated at the center. So for example, our center here is zero. So it's going to be e to the zeroth for our zeroth derivative, which is one. e to the zeroth for our first derivative, e to the zeroth for the second and third and fourth and fifth derivatives. There's no, I don't have any need for the rest of that <laughs> table. I built my table way too large. Sorry about that. So uh, the rest of that you can erase. Uh, I can just erase this right there. There we go. So we have this table we built. Let's go ahead now and figure out uh, if all of the nth derivatives at the center are the same, then you could just substitute that in. No matter what derivative I'm looking at, when I plugged in zero, all their values were ones. So no matter what, that's just gonna be a one. And guess what we get? That very familiar power series expansion, which is actually the Taylor series centered at zero, which some people also call the McLaurin series, whatever. Okay. But there we go. We've proven now that e to the x, if it's equal to its power series, e to the x is equal to that summation right there. Pretty awesome. And by the way, that's in our list of power series that I put on the other page in the other uh, section. So I'm not going to have to rewrite that here, but there you go. Pretty cool. Uh, they did ask, by the way, for the radius of convergence. Um, and to find the radius of convergence, we actually did this earlier, but you would use the ratio test. Because we had to build this power series, you have to actually find the radius of convergence. And we've already done this in a previous problem, but I'll do it here very quickly. Ratio test, take the n plus first term, multiply that by the reciprocal of the nth term, and you will see that this becomes the absolute value of x times the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n plus one. That limit always turns into zero. So this product is always zero, which means our limit that we're doing the ratio test for is always less than one, which means the series always converges technically absolute, uh, uh, absolutely, but 
And that implies radius of convergence is infinite. It converges for any value of X we want to plug in. No matter what we plug in for X, that limit will always be zero. And we know from the ratio test, if the limit is less than one, we have convergence. So very, very cool. It took us a while to get to that E to the X proof, but we did it. Questions on that? And I will mute myself and take a sip. All right. Well, if there are no questions, we'll hop forward. This is the online content. I'm just going to mention um, very quickly why I shuttled this to being the online content. It's because um, in our previous problem, we got to this end and I said, oh, see? So guess what? E to the X is equal to We've proven that e to the x is equal to the summation n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. However, I had that caveat it on there. If f has a power series and f is equal to that power series. So that's where this online content comes in where I've told you, you don't have to worry about this, but just gonna say it very quickly in a two minute snippet. Um, you can prove that a function is equal to its power series if you only add up the first, let's say, 20 terms of your power series. In this case, in the video, I, I said, let's only add up the first three. So if you add up the first three terms of the power series, you still have an infinite number of terms of your power series that you didn't add up, right? You have a, um, a fourth power term, a fifth power term, a sixth power term, and so on and so forth. What we want to do is we want to say that if as n goes to infinity, the number of terms, obviously that you have not added up, they actually still are a number of an infinite number of terms. But if the limit as n goes to infinity of that ter turns to zero, that's called the Taylor remainder. So let me just showcase that. Taylor remainder here is just the difference between your real function and your uh, Taylor polynomial expansion, just your nth degree Taylor polynomial expansion. If this tends to disappear over time, then, in other words, if this tends to zero, then these two have to equal over time. In other words, your function has to equal your Taylor polynomial. That's the punchline. You do not have to worry about that, but that's what the online content is all about, is proving that. And by the end of that, we end up proving that e to the x is actually equal to its, ta its Taylor polynomial expansion. Again, you do not have to watch that video. You will not be held to any of its content in the uh, homework or in an exam or a quiz, but it's nice to know, like there is a reason why uh, e to the x is actually equal to its power series expansion. And it is because um, if you add up the first billion terms of this, the remaining terms, which is still an infinite number of terms. It's the billion and first term and the billionth and second term and so on and so forth. If it, all of those extra terms that add up at the end, for any value of X, those will end up converging to zero. They'll end up being so minuscule, they don't make a difference. And so therefore E to the X is pretty much equivalent to the nth degree Taylor polynomial. But again, the proof is done in the online lecture. E to the X is actually equal to summation. Uh, it has never been the case that we held students to uh, knowing that Taylor inequality or the Taylor remainder, except for one little piece, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So not a biggie. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and still play with these because I think this is much more important to play with uh, these than to, um, to go into that theory for right now. So uh, what's my note here? Well, theoretically important, the reality is that the vast majority of the functions we deal with are actually equal to their Taylor polynomial expansions. Therefore, I will not have you prove that the remainder tends to zero. That's me officially saying that. There you go. So basically, you are allowed to uh, do what I'm about to do now. Find the Maclaurin series of F and find the associated radius and interval of convergence. Yay. 
We happen to know, this is like that um, tan inverse example we did earlier. We happen to know the power series or the Taylor series for e to the x. This is like, for example, um, I need a bigger pen. Let me get a bigger pen here. Let's see if I can use this one. Yeah, that's big enough. Okay. This is like e to the happy face. Well, that's a very small happy face. Let me zoom out to make my happy face big enough. It's like e to the happy face. And we happen to know the power series expansion for e to the happy face. We just wrote it down. e to the happy face is equal to the summation n equals zero to infinity of happy face to the nth power over n factorial. It's e to the x is equal to the summation x to the n over n factorial, okay? And the condition is that happy face uh, actually, there is no condition. That converges for all values. So the interval of convergence here is negative infinity to infinity. Converges no matter what happy face is, okay? So we're going to use that same idea here. This is e to a power. We're just going to say that's x to the fourth times the summation n equals zero to infinity of that power raised to the nth all over n factorial. And now we just clean this up. That's it. It's very fast, right? Once you know that the form for the power series or the Taylor series, I'm gonna call them Taylor series from this point forward. So once you know the Taylor series for a function, it is pretty easy to just say, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and plug that in. As long as you're centering at zero, I'll make that a big deal in a moment in another example, but for right now, let's just finish this one out. So that's gonna be a negative one to the nth. That is very common that we, if there's an alternation, we just write that separately as a negative one to the nth. So get used to that, please. Times three to the nth times x to the two nth all over n factorial. Now you're going to bring the power of X in. And yes, you do have to do that. It is actually kind of important. It's a good habit to get into because it'll pay you back when you get into differential equations. So this will be the summation. N equals zero to infinity. Alternation factor times three to the nth X to the two N. And we're adding four more powers there all over N factorial. Done. Now that's the um, Taylor series for that function centered at zero. That's what Maclaurin series means is Taylor series centered at X equals zero. That's what that means. So we found that. And by the way, the radius of convergence, not gonna change, it's just not. We did not integrate, we did not differentiate, and we knew the original uh, radius of convergence for our power series was infinite. Well, this is also gonna be infinite. There's just no restriction on, on it. So the uh, radius of convergence is infinite. The interval of convergence, negative infinity to infinity. Another way you could think about this is that the original power series will converge if happy face, <laughs> terrible happy face, if happy face is between negative infinity and infinity. Well, our happy face in this case is a negative three X squared. And that has to be between negative infinity and infinity. If you divide both sides by a negative three, and take the square root of both sides, well, you can't take the square root of negative infinity, but <laughs> whatever, still, <laughs> uh, it actually ends up being positive, doesn't it? Uh, but it's, it's okay, because it's still between negative infinity and infinity. It still will converge no matter what. 
there's actually when you take the square root of both sides you get the absolute value of x so there you go so you get the absolute value of x has to be between negative infinity or infinity so therefore x itself has to be between negative infinity and infinity <sighs> it bothers me it's written that way it just really bothers me all right so uh because we didn't differentiate or integrate no change to the uh, interval of convergence. Yay. All right. Let's try another one. Um, okay. So I, I made, I said it loudly in the last example. I had said, <clears throat> you could, as long as you have a power series representation or a Taylor series for your function, you could just take this and plug that into your Taylor series. Yay. But you can only do that. I'll write this in red. Oh, which I replaced that with red. So let me replace this back. Just plug this into the Taylor series which was what we did. We plugged negative three X squared into the Taylor series right here. Um, but only if we are centering at zero. Because that's how the Taylor series was built. The Taylor series for e to the x that we are dealing with was built being centered at zero. If you go back to, gosh, I don't know where it was, but it was somewhere. I think it was the second page of this, third page. If we go back to our proof that e to the x is equal to the summation x to the n over n factorial, we centered at zero for that entire proof. That entire proof was built on being centered at zero. The moment somebody comes along and changes the game and says, hey, guess what I need you to do? That's not it. The moment somebody comes along and says, guess what? I need you to find out what f of x, the power series for f of x equals e to negative x, centered at negative four. Once they center elsewhere, you have to rebuild the entire series using the Taylor series expansion. So I'm going to point an arrow at this. This is not zero. So we need to rebuild the Taylor series. That is kind of a pain, such as life. We will have a lot of Taylor series that um, we're going to prove, but they're all centered at zero with the exception of one. The natural log is actually centered at negative one, but whatever. So uh, we are, uh, well, I think it's centered at one. Anyway, we are, for the rest of our power series, we're, we're, centering them at zero for our proofs. So all of our theorems are centered at zero. Um, so again, that warning above says, the following example shows that we must rebuild the entire Taylor series expansion once we center somewhere other than zero. So let's go ahead and do that. It's good practice. So what you're gonna do is build a table. N versus the nth derivative at X versus the nth derivative at the center, in the center, I'll call A, but we know A is negative four, okay? We're gonna start with the zeroth derivative, then we'll go to the first derivative, then we'll go to the second derivative, and so on and so forth. And hopefully we can find a pattern. Heads up, patterns are very hard to find. My best advice when it comes to finding a pattern in mathematics is do not simplify your mathematics. That's the easiest way to find a pattern. Raj mentioned, mentioned it earlier when we went through the proof, oh, what page am I on 10? Good. Raj had mentioned it earlier that when we went through this proof right here, he'd said, why 
is that not, why aren't you writing that as a six? And my response was because I would never see the pattern if I did. And notice because I didn't simplify these numbers right here to be instead of zero factor factorial to be one, to be one, to be two and to be six, I left them as factorials unsimplified. It gives me the pattern. So that's a very common trick as you move forward in mathematics. If you're looking for a pattern, do not simplify your work. Instead, leave things raw and see if there's a pattern in the raw work that you have. Let me go back down to page 10. All right. So the zeroth derivative is always the original function. And then we take the first derivative. The first derivative is going to be a negative e to the negative x. And the second derivative is going to be a negative times a negative or a positive e to the negative x. And the next derivative will be a negative times a positive or a negative e to the negative x. You can see, actually, there will be a nice, beautiful pattern here, right? The fourth derivative is a negative times a negative. It's a positive e to the negative x. Now all we need to do is evaluate each of those at the center, which is going to be negative four here. That'll be e to the negative negative four, and then e to the, or I'm sorry, negative e to the negative negative four, and then e to the negative negative four, and a negative e to the negative negative four, and so on and so forth. And you can see there is an alternating pattern here, right? If you take a look at this, it's like negative one to the zeroth e to the fourth. Notice that I wrote that as a zeroth because I'm trying to include the end that I'm at. This is negative one to the first e to the fourth. This is negative one to the second e to the fourth. This is negative one to the third, e to the fourth. So if you like patterns and puzzles, then you'll really dig this stuff. This is basically just patterns and puzzles throughout. So the Taylor series of e to the negative x centered at negative four is the following. Summation n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative evaluated at a over n factorial times x minus a to the nth. All I'm doing is writing the Taylor polynomial formula first so that you can see where I'm getting everything. This is going to equal summation n equals zero to infinity we can see, for example, the fourth derivative is negative one to the fourth e to the fourth. The third derivative is negative one to the third e to the fourth and so on and so forth. So the nth derivative must be negative one to the nth e to the fourth. So that's what I'm gonna put in here. The nth derivative is gonna be negative one to the nth e to the fourth power all over n factorial times the quantity x minus the center, center is at negative four, so it's x minus negative four or x plus four to the nth. There you go. That is the power series expansion or the Taylor series of e to the negative x centered at negative four. And actually I wanna showcase that. So I wanna really give you uh, the confidence that you could do this. Let me bring up my Desmos here. So let me share my screen. Oh, where's Desmos? Right there. Okay. And I'm going to type in here, um, I'll type y equals e to the negative x first. Okay, so there's our e to the negative x. And now I'm going to type f of x is equal to, and we'll type sum 
n equals zero to i'm gonna go from zero to uh a and we'll set a slider for a uh of negative one raised to the nth e to the fourth divided by n factorial times x plus four raised to the nth that's what our, we found it was going to be i'm going to add a slider here and i'm going to let a start at uh one and i'm going to let it go to 20 step size one all right it's going to be hard to see let me uh i'll have to zoom out a little bit okay we're centering at negative four what does that mean centering at negative four it means that what we want precise accuracy for is at x equals negative four and notice if i go to x equals negative four it's all the way up here honestly uh, i think it's right about where's negative four still up a bit right there so at negative four right about here you see the two functions are pretty much identical let me turn off let me turn off my power series. There's the actual function. Turn on my power series. We're looking at x equals negative four right there, okay? If I zoom out though, you'll see that my power series, which is in blue, is just a line. If I start adding more terms, so right now I'm summing from n equals zero to one. If I go to n equals, let's say 10, notice, that my blue curve, my power series, is linking up to my e to the negative x really nicely for a while, all the way out to x equals maybe a negative 1.7. Remember, it's centered at negative 4. So we have a pretty wide radius of convergence so far, about a, a, a 3, a radius of convergence of 3. As you add more terms, you'll get more accuracy. It takes a while, but you get it, right? So as I went to the 20th term of this expansion, uh, my radius of convergence is even larger. And the more terms I add, the larger the radius of convergence. That blue curve matches e to the x beautifully otherwise. It's incredibly close. I'll turn off my power series, and you can see there's e to the x in red. Turn on the power series, and there you go. It's matching beautifully at least near x equals negative 4. So uh, it looks as though our power series expansion, Taylor series, about two, sorry, I was just thinking that it just logged me out, but it didn't. Our power series expansion about two or negative four, sorry, uh, is, uh, is it looks to be correct. So again, punchline there, everybody. Uh, if, sorry, I, this thing's going wild on me right now. If, uh, you're asked to center a power series other at some place other than zero, you have to rebuild the power series. That's if you're given a function that you have a power series representation of, an e to the x we happen to have if we're centering at zero. All right, I hope that makes sense so far. Yep, we have time for the next one. Now let's have some fun. Let's go ahead and prove that the cosine or the sine, whichever you guys want to do, we're going to prove one of those is equal to these power series. So the cosine is an even function. Notice its powers on its Taylor expansion are even. The sine is an odd function. Notice the powers on its polynomial expansion are odd. Very beautiful. Uh, I will answer to the first person who wants it. Cosine or sine? I don't care. Sign. All right. So we're going to prove that the sign is equal to that power series. Let's prove the sign. All right. So um, to prove that the sign, so we're going to do the sign here. To prove that the sign is equal to this power series expansion, we're going to go ahead and build that table. Start with N here. And my advice when you build this table is actually to not draw all three columns at once. Draw the first column. And then 
write in the second column, which is the nth derivative of your function. So I just, I'm dealing with f of x equals sine of x. I want to just look at all the derivatives. So let's go ahead and at least do that, right? So the nth derivative of the sine. So the zeroth derivative of the sine is sine. The reason why I leave space, uh, I don't put the third column in yet, is because sometimes derivatives just get huge. And so you want to leave some space to work. That's all. The first derivative of the sine is the cosine. Derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. Derivative of the negative sine is the negative cosine. Derivative of the negative cosine is a positive sine. Derivative of the sine is a cosine. Derivative of the cosine is negative sine, right? Beautiful pattern already created. Now let's figure out what those nth derivatives are evaluated at the center. And when I say the center, notice here is x right here. It's not x minus a, is it? That is x minus zero. So the center for both of these is zero on both of them, okay? Uh, and in fact, all the proofs that you're gonna do are centered at zero. And then if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be working on a problem where they say, no, nope, I need to center that elsewhere, then you have to recreate the power series expansion by using the process we're doing right now. Everything you'd recreate would basically be the same. Whether I'm centering at zero or I'm centering at 27, this part is the same. The only difference is what I'm doing right now. The nth derivative at the center. That's the only difference when you do, when you rebuild, you just go, okay, he wants me to center at 27. Let me go ahead and plug 27s into these. All right, but here I'm centering at zero. So what is sine of zero? We know zero. Cosine of zero, we know is one. Negative sine of zero, zero. C negative cosine of zero, negative one. Sine of zero, zero. Cosine of zero, one. Sine of negative zero, uh, zero, and so on and so forth. Now, I highly recommend always writing down the Taylor polynomial or the Taylor series formula. So I'm going to write this here. I'm going to say sine of X. We know if it has a Taylor series, it's going to be the summation n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative evaluated the center, which we're doing zero um, over n factorial times X minus zero to the nth. Let's go ahead and just write out a few terms of this. When n is equal to zero, we get the zeroth derivative evaluated at zero over zero factorial, x to the zeroth, plus the first derivative evaluated at zero over one factorial, x to the first, plus the second derivative evaluated at zero over two factorial, x squared, plus the third derivative evaluated at zero over three factorial, x to the third, plus the fourth derivative evaluate, I know it's exhaustive. I'm just showcasing this so that you can see what's gonna happen. Dot, 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 all right. Let's steal the information from our table. The zeroth derivative evaluated at zero is zero. The first derivative evaluated at zero is one. The second derivative evaluated at zero is zero. The third derivative evaluated at zero is negative one. The fourth derivative evaluated at zero is zero. The fifth derivative evaluated at zero is one. And so on and so forth. Notice when you expand this polynomial out, all the even powers disappear for our odd function sign, and we're only left with odd powers. And if you wanted to write this as a summation, you could say, okay, I'm gonna sum from zero to infinity. It has an alternation, right? Positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive. So this seems about right. 
When n is zero, it's positive. When n is one, it's negative. When n is two, it's positive. When n is three, it's negative. All right. And it's going to be over. Let's see. Our first denominator is one, but we're starting at zero here. Well, if we only want odd numbers, the easiest way to get to an odd number is 2n plus 1. Let's see if that fits with these denominators. When n is equal to 0, 2n plus 1 is 2 times 0 plus 1, or 1 factorial. When n is equal to 1, we get 2 times 1 plus 1, which is 3 factorial. When n is equal to 2, we get 2 times 2 plus 1, which is 5 factorial. And the powers match that. So there we go. We have proven that the sine of x is actually equal to that Taylor series expansion about zero. And we'll pick up here next time to do the interval of convergence, uh, but it, it is all infinity. We'll pick up here next time for that. Remember, you guys have a quiz today, 11.6. Um, I forget how many minutes I said it was, but I think it was like 12. Um, and it's one question. So uh, I will see you there. Otherwise, uh, office hours will be in eight minutes. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.